uh, one of the topics that I would like to talk with you is your movement around the world. Mm -hmm. you, you start studying in, in Bristol. Yeah. yeah. So right. That's right. Now, as a geologist, it's interesting to look back at Bristol because I was taught tectonics before plate tectonics was accepted. So I was taught geosynclinal theory by an expert on fossil fish. And I didn't understand a thing that he was saying. It seemed like nonsense. So I went and read um, Arthur Holmes's second edition book, where it all made sense. It was all to do with convection and things. So I failed the exam because I wrote down Holmes instead of geosynclinal theory. So as far as geology is concerned, Bristol was not great for me. But I, because I failed the geology, I did physics instead, which was very useful. But the most important influence on me there was a chap called Charles Frank, who was the head of the physics department at the time, uh, but had an amateur interest in geology and geophysics. So he taught me that geophysics was a respectable thing what for a physicist to do. What happened exactly the moment when you decide to move into the geophysics? Oh, that was when I came to Oxford to interview for PhD places in the physics department. But they also said you could have a look at these people in geology who say they're doing physics, but it isn't really. And so that's where I met Ron Oxborough and Stephen Richardson, who were my supervisors. And I thought they were much more interesting people to work with than the... So it was a sort of uh, it was an empathy. It was, yes, but it was also an accident that I ever visited the Earth Sciences Department here. Really? Yeah, yeah. So I met these people. I thought they'd be fun to work with. And so that's what I did. So I changed at that point. To change from a physicist to a geologist, you need to learn the um, to relax <laughs> about uh, your science. I mean, a physicist constructs very precisely defined experiments. In geology, nature carries out her experiments, and we try to figure out what she was up to. So that's where I learned how to, as an, a graduate student, I learned how to think about geological problems rather than the very well-defined physical problems. In fact, you have a, a change in the mindset when you move oh, yeah. from, from physics to geology. Did your advisor help you to do this, or you did it by yourself? I think you, you learn it by osmosis. You're, a, you're an apprentice to these people, and you gradually figure out how they think, and you adopt some aspects of how they think and reject others. It's like any... PhD experience, you learn how to be a scientist partly by observing and emulating the people you admire, but also by critically assessing whether you agree with their way of doing things. So I certainly don't think my supervisors would claim that I ended up thinking the same way that they did, but I certainly ended up thinking differently from when I started. What happened when you moved then to Cambridge? Oh, um, what difference in the environment and the department? Cambridge is a very different experience because when I moved there, I moved to the Department of Geodesy and Geophysics. So it was a geophysics department, and they didn't necessarily think very much about geology as such. So it was a very classical geophysics department. Uh, then you moved to the other side of the pub? Yes, moved to Harvard for uh, six years. Yes. Very different people in uh, the US? Oh, it was, it was, it was a different, yeah, the US, the whole experience of working in the US is fantastic, as I'm sure you, you know, recognize. It's the sort of openness of the scientific community, the generosity of spirit, it's fantastic. The Harvard department was, was, was actually, the geophysicists were wonderful people to work with, but it was a fragmented department. The geophysicists and the geologists and the paleontologists didn't really talk to each other. They didn't really understand each other's disciplines. So it was 
it was not what I was um, uh, used to where, when I was a graduate student here. All the, you know, everybody talked to everybody else. And even though in Cambridge I was in a geophysics department, you would still talk to the geologists who were in a de different building. In Harvard, there was, there was quite a lot of tension between the different branches of the subject. Which of these <coughs> prestigious places uh, you felt more uh, the ambition in the people? Oh, probably mostly in, in the American environment, yes. What about the passion? Oh, I think that's... Now it depends what you mean about passion for research or passion for the whole business, because uh, universities ought to be um, places where research and teaching are equally important. And in the US system, as I experienced it in the 80s, teaching was um, secondary. It was something you had to do because you were supposed to. Both Cambridge and Oxford, what I found was, uh, what I still think is the case, people are deeply committed both to teaching and to doing research. What do you remember about being in the Alps? Uh, what do I remember most about the Alps? Just for two Being taken across the Alps by Rudolf Trumpy in the, on a, a, a transect across the Alps, that was fantastic. Have you been in Himalaya? Uh, yes, more in Tibet than in the Himalayas though. Um, but a beautiful place, and where the people were integrated with their very harsh environment. It was, it was magical. Uh, Greece? Ah, well, Greece. I spent a lot of time working in Greece. Uh, what are the impressions? The light. The light in the Mediterranean. Uh, and the people are wonderful. I love working with them. I've worked mostly in Greek. The Greek people I've worked with are geodesists, people who measure the shape of the Earth. And the Greeks have been measuring the shape of the Earth since, you know, thousands of years. And, and it's wonderful to work with these people. So precise, so logical, but also really nice, wonderful human beings. So in Greece you're still studying actively now, yes, right? Yes, yes. So, um, and I know you're studying earthquakes. Yeah. So I bet a lot of people, they ask you if all the earthquakes they are predictable and I would like to know how you answer to that question when I bet a lot of people would ask you. Yep, though the earthquakes are not predictable. No. That's your sharp yep. que is answer? Yep. yep. Where, where are we in the state of the art? to try Same earth? place that we were 40, 50 years ago. Pe people are saying we're nearly going to be able to predict earthquakes. But so, but is the research community going into that direction or try to resolve that question that the community uh, posed? Not a, that's not a simple question to answer. Um, but that's what the, the community would like to have answered, right? The society. Maybe. I mean, I, I think what society should concentrate on is making their buildings safer. If you look to people to predict earthquakes for you, you're not taking responsibility for your own safety. What you should do is ask yourself, do I know who built my house? Do I trust the person who built my house to have built it safely? Not to put the responsibility on scientists uh, to predict the next earthquake for you. So it's kind of handing over to the engineers? Yeah. Yeah, I see. And the very last question is... Uh, Earthquakes don't kill people. Buildings do. <laughs> is there anything that you want to suggest to young researchers or students that are uh, approaching uh, your disciplines, the disciplines that you are uh, most aware of? I don't want to make... I don't want to offer advice to the young. When I was young I didn't listen to advice from people my age and perhaps I was right not to. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs>